just checking the time. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for taking the time to be here. Also, um, very well done for braving our very strong winds today. Um, Fondazione World Art now, as do I. We appreciate it a lot. Um, also, thank you to Fondazione World Art now for having reached out um, a few weeks ago and speaking as a World Art now veteran, as Mario had surmised, I first hand know of Mario's very high standard, so I will, be, I will be giving it my best shot. And I'm trying to summarize 60,000 words in around 15 minutes, so please be patient. But to start off, barely seven weeks after the remnants of the pedestal convoy had limped into Grand Harbor in August 1942, the acting Lieutenant Governor, David Campbell, had addressed the Maltese through Red Diffusion for the first time. He had reached out to the 270,000 or so people who had the unfortunate privilege of living here during the most horrific um, state of the 1940s. But obviously, he was effusive in his praise. He spoke about his pride to, quote unquote, to have been allowed to serve in your island fortress. Malta was always a fortress, and the Maltese and the Gosetins, uh, let's not forget them, there's at least one of them here. Um, um, we were just unfortunate inhabitants. He had been in Malta for just over a month, but he learned to appreciate the magnificent spirit which, he ha which had enabled the besieged to endure unflinchingly the dangers and privations of the previous two years. He had also learned of the hardships that were burdening daily life or what was left of it. He spoke of the coming winter season with its cold weather, recent ration amendments, the victory kitchens, the communal feeding policy, price capping as well, the scourge of the black market, which could never have been curtailed or wiped out. And he spoke about, lastly, confidence in the future. And this is how he finished his broadcast. That is what we're aiming at, and I will endeavor to ensure that nothing which Nothing would further this policy is left undone. You, for your part, must continue to endure and to look forward to better days, remembering that the food front is the battlefront in Malta, and that every day which passes takes us one step nearer to the lifting of the blockade. Now, in doing so, he, Campbell tried to strike a balance between, well, a morale boost, but also not getting these people's hopes up. They had to keep on to endure. As Campbell had quite easily surmised, the food front was indeed Malta's battlefront. Now, if you look at these pictures, and if you've read about the Second World War, um, much has been written about the colony's military role during the Second World War. The unsinkable aircraft carrier, island fortress, I can keep going on. Now, these images are just a select few which are produced online when one types in Malta World War II. These pictures are common, popular. You've got pictures of artillery positions, the Ohio sailing in or limping in, aircraft. Um, but the colonial narrative is further reinforced of this place having been a bulwark against Axis designs in the region. But the Maltese, were shifted to the periphery in visual representations and oral traditions as well, as you can see from the two pictures in the top right-hand corner. I'm pretty sure you've seen or you have come across these pictures, people, mostly women and children, girls, lining up to get their rations from the victory kitchens, and people trying to seek shelter in underground um, um, railway tunnels or in big shelters. But the people that you see here were at the bottom of the food chain, pun unintended. I didn't see that earlier. Now, their lives, these peasants' lives, had remained unchanged for centuries. Most of them, as you can see, were barefoot. They were illiterate. Um, no sanitation whatsoever. They merely tried to eke out a living any way they can, any way they could. The rural areas and the country folk had never been high on the agenda of colonial rulers, since rulers rarely have to bother what goes on in the villages. 
peasants were people who stood outside history. Now, history in this case isn't the past. It's how we interact with the past. It's a, the process of change, how we get from point A to point B. And for Honoré de Balzac, these people were noble savages. However, they could be tamed. And that was one of the approaches which the colonial government took during the Second World War. These people occupied a little world. Their, this world consisted of their family, their village, their community, their work, and their belief system. That's it. They were insular, isolated. But this little world was wedged wide open in June 1940, when thousands of refugees from the Inner Harbor area flooded the countryside, seeking, seeing accommodation and basically protection and help. And these people were strangers in their own country. In addition to this, the colony had never been self-sustainable. Malta had never been self-sustainable, even going back to the late medieval period. So that's a number of centuries. Now, for 270,000 people to be fed, this was the problem of problems. State intervention in wartime prioritized survival as its fundamental policy. The authorities dictated what farmers had to plant and harvest over how large an area they were told what to listen to, who to listen to, how to act and how to react. And these communities, as Mari said, were not idle um, victims of wartime policies. They resisted in any way they can. They dragged their feet, protested, sent letters. We'll be seeing one of them, which I discovered last year in the presentation. And they inhibited government's work and expectations as well. Now, lobby groups were roped into the war effort while the church also had a bit of a part to play as an agent of colonialism. And these points will be discussed in the following presentation. But firstly, I think a short summary on this sector will be merited. Now, agriculture was the traditional economic base on which most rural dwellers depended for centuries. And a few names and a few words linked to the areas and villages in both Mort and Gozo attest to this fact. Fiddin, which is an area um, to the west of Rabat, is an allusion to silver, silvery, fidda. This area was used for cotton plantation. Folia, the land of beans, Asri, Imrihel, a grazing ground. Today, it's anything but. And, well, Zebuch, olives. Now, over the following centuries, at the start of the British occupation, in 1800, um, import, the importance of cotton decreased little by little. Malta was changed into a trade emporium. Um, Egyptian cotton was imported, which sounded the death knell of local cotton. This was substituted for potato and tobacco. And as a result, even today, potato is the only cash crop we've got. Now, by the mid 1860s, agriculture became of marginal importance. And over the previous decades, so those 60 years, Malta's strategic position in the Mediterranean was further reaffirmed. Um, in the 1810s, during the occupation of Sicily, Malta was a looter's paradise during Napoleon's continental system. Um, the 1820s, at the Greek Civil War, 1850s, the Crimean War. So Malta was used as a, as a springboard from which power could be projected around the Mediterranean. So, an emphasis on the cultivation and storage of wheat started taking hold. The fortress had to be kept fed. This opening of the Suez Canal in the late 1860s further aggravated this problem. The economy shifted from that of a trade center to a transshipment bunkering station. Industry sprang up around the harbor, so that's Valletta and the three cities, and the population followed suit. As you can see, this is a map dated to 1901, showing the cities, the suburbs, and the countryside. The orange part, so it's Valletta and the three cities, that held 60,000 people. Valletta today holds less than 2,000. Uh, you've got the suburban area, as you can see, um, um, Hamrun, Paula, Tarshin, and you've got the rural area, throughout which 36,000 people lived. Now, over this century, two nations were forged. 
You had the people who looked to the sea for connection, so the people who lived in the inner harbour area and the suburban area, who worked at the dockyard or close to the dockyard or uh, had a job linked to harbour facilities of some sort. Then you had peasants or people who lived in the rural areas. They had fleeting links to market towns. They did go to the suburbs, maybe even the city, to sell their wares, but they went back home in a few hours. Most of them never, had never actually set foot in Valletta. Most Gosadins never ever actually crossed over to Malta. So as I said, you had one nation which looked outside for connections, connectivity, and one side which was insular, and that was the, um, well, the peasant community. Now, World War I had altered the island's foodstuffs economy. Because of restrictions, price capping, the Food Control Board, so on and so forth, these were boards which were reconstituted in the 30s during the Abyssinian crisis and the, um, the Second World War. Farmers were killing their stock without endeavouring to renew it. So the livestock industry was nearly killed off. Um, this did not pay. The cost of manure, labour and rents went up. Most notably of all, farmers were overcharged for the seed potatoes they had bought. Now, indirectly, because Malta's cash crop by the early 1900s became the, well, potatoes, um, Malta's destiny or Malta's agrarian destiny was further intertwined with that of the mother country because 95% of seed potatoes came from Ireland, the other 5% came from England. So if there were any problems in the mother country, we would surely have felt them over here, as these people did when the blockade was imposed in the early 40s. Now, I mentioned um, that farmers were overcharged for seed potatoes. An individual from Hamroon by the name of L.P. Cristiano, I still haven't uncovered a picture of this um, individual, on the 17th of May 1919, this person, Christian, had requested permission from the government to hold a meeting on the glasses at Blat al -Baida, so as to inform farmers that they had been indeed overcharged and they had, were cheated by importers. He was informed that he had sent his application too close to the date. He wanted to hold his meeting on the 25th of May. They said, well, no, it's too late. Secondly, you're semi-illiterate and we won't give you a permit. However, in the minutes of this file, um, officials wrote that granting permission for a crowd of farmers, quote, unquote, to converge at a time of political discontent caused by high cost of living was most unwise. Close quote. Now, this was the 17th of um, May, 1919. Three weeks later to the date, the bread riots broke out on the 7th of June. Now, most people look upon politics as a dirty word, especially in this country. People mistake politics for partisan politics, tribalism. Politics is about negotiation. It's about dialogue. I may not agree with you. I may not agree with what you have to say, but we can get from point A to point B. Now, peasants weren't deemed to be political animals in the traditional sense. They didn't wear suits. They didn't even wear shoes. But they did know how to negotiate. This was one such person, this was one such way, excuse me, how one person tried to negotiate, but it was deemed too dangerous. He, he would have inflamed the situation. I think in this case, the government was proved right as people were killed and shot by the army on the um, 7th of June in Valletta. But farmers used weapons of what is called, or what are called weapons of the weak. They drag their feet, they protest, they go out on strike, they feign ignorance to get their point across. And this is how farmers and peasants um, try to get their politics across. I mean, we saw this a couple of months ago when hundreds of farmers converged onto Ali and Valletta, which is part of a much larger agrarian movement all around the world. But we'll get to this later on. Now, the Department of Agriculture was set up in 1919. That's more than a century into colonial rule. Before this date, agriculture was, let's say, controlled by an office, of an office of agriculture within the Department of Public Works. But the first superintendent slash director of agriculture was that person 
at the top right hand corner, Dr. later Professor John Borch. Responsibility for this sector fell to the Mortis administration in 1921, and the self-government constitution was granted, which showed that this, this sector, agriculture, was never high on the, on, the, um, um, on the colonial agenda. If this was that important, it would have been still kept by the imperial government. But this was back under colonial guidance by the mid-30s, when the constitution was further revoked. Unfortunately, the department and the people over here suffered from lack of technical knowledge and investment and you also had a perpetual emigration of farmers and laborers. Now, over here you had two kinds of emigration. This was, this was tied to work, tied to livelihood, but people either emigrated to well, plow land somewhere else, as most people did in Australia and North Africa, then you had military emigration. You had people, men, obviously, um, joining foreign forces to be mercenaries. But this... Um, this steady stream of migrants started in the 1820s, 1830s. It intensified by the late 19th century, and it got even more drastic during the interwar period. There were no jobs, no opportunities. Land was being parceled into smaller um, allotments, which weren't, um, weren't, weren't enough to actually keep a family going. A farmer needed 42 moly of land with which to feed six people. By the interwar period, the average area which every full-time farmer had was 10 tumuli. So poverty was rampant. The boy, which you see, which you can see on the right, he was called Carmel Vella. He was 16 years old from Limbordine, a hamlet just north of Imjar. And at age 16, he was sent to Australia. Reason for work. So even at age 16, these people still tried to seek pastures new around the world. This wasn't, this wasn't that uncommon. You had even boys who were younger, even 15, who went to North Africa and Canada and Detroit to work, to try their luck. Agricultural expansion was hindered by geography, lack of space, and as I, as I said earlier on, parceling of land. Because of the international situation, the Great Depression, Italy flexing its muscles, Prices fluctuated, there were high rents, there were, there were not enough laborers, a lot of them emigrated, so um, labor did cost a lot, and farmers were indebted to auctioneers and Maltese, El Pitcala. One big problem in the interwar period, starting in the mid 20s, you had the military take up of land for defense purposes. You can see from that um, map over there. The green patch of land was area, was an area reserved for military purposes and military maneuvers. The yellow patch, which is further inland, was a military clearance area, which meant that the military could go in and do as it seemed fit. So it was dictatorial. But the most land-hungry arm of the military in colonial motto was the RAF. Um, billets had to be built. Land had to be torn up and rubble walls had to be demolished as well. And it was estimated by one of the wartime RAF commanders, Hugh Pugh Lloyd, that during the construction of Halfar Elf airfield, around 75 miles of rubble walls were torn down. That was prime agricultural land which was lost forever. And the exportation of potato crop was paused due to unsteady relations in Northern Europe in the mid in the late 30s. These markets were lost after hostilities started in the West in early 1940. Now, in October 1939, Malcolm MacDonald actually, uh, Malcolm MacDonald, who was the colonial secretary, had circulated among the colonies a table of principal agricultural imports into Malta for the year 1936. What he saw fit to make other colonies' governments aware of our food list remains to be seen. But this list presented the kind of food and products they needed by the islands in peacetime. And it makes for interesting reading. Quote, more than 1,220,000 worth of articles had to be annually shipped to keep the colony afloat. Tobacco, lard, cheese, preserved milk and different kinds of meat were imported from the USA, Argentina, 
New Zealand, Norway, Lithuania, and Poland. So, all around the world. Parcels were shipped in from Turkey and China, and MacDonald finished his dispatch with the following. The dependence of Malta on imported foodstuffs is very considerable, and it is unlikely that it can be lessened, as practically all arable land is cultivated. The above imports do not include the requirements of the naval and military establishment. There is little or no possibility of increasing production appreciably, and the provisioning of the dependency must remain primarily a defense problem. So what MacDonald was saying is that we were on our last legs. Now, in, in 1940, when the war started for the Maltese, that was in June 1940, um, um, the government had taken a laissez-faire approach to the local agricultural center. A liberal farming was the order of the day. Things were to carry on as they were, and this was down to two reasons. Firstly, to, well, not panic the people. People had already taken to hoarding, and they had already hoarded significant foodstuffs and articles from um, groceries in September 1939, when Germany um, barged into Poland. And, um, um, and to not cause inflation, obviously. So things were to carry on as they were. But one man attempted to put the sector onto a war footing, and that was this man here, Giuseppe Micallif, who was the director of agriculture following John Borch between 1933 and 1940. He recognized earlier on that a peacetime approach to agriculture would have to eventually change. He did try to suggest rationing be put in place early 1940, the government said no for the previous aforementioned reasons, to not cause panic. But Malta has always had a perennial water problem, so he instituted the reconditioning of disused public wells in Valletta and the villages, thereby increasing water storage by hundreds of thousands of gallons, all for 1,600 pounds. Now, back then, it was a sum, but it was good enough. Censuses of farmland and animals were taken, he encouraged the growing of vegetables in public gardens and public sites. And owners of animals kept for pleasure were ordered to have them slaughtered. There was a poor response overall. People just didn't take any notice of this. So this necessitated the introduction and intensification of propaganda. And this was a form of peasant resistance, feigned ignorance. He was prohibited from using colonial funds to dig for underground galleries and wells. This could have led to a significant difference later on. Unfortunately, he wasn't given the colonial funds because the cry back then in the mid-30s to the late 30s was economy. We can't give you any more money. Secondly, the other reason could have been tribalism, partisan politics. Um, Giuseppe Micallef was a former nationalist minister of agriculture. He obviously took a step down to be director of agriculture, he was vilified and attacked mercilessly over seven years in the Stricklandian press in Il Berra and the Times of Malta. Unfortunately, unfortunately for him, he didn't actually live that long. Um, he was riddled with ill health. He was replaced as director of agriculture you know, on January 1940, and he died three weeks later. His replacement lasted till the 15th of April. And then Tancred Mercia was further replaced by Oscar Samut. So in less than four months, the, the chief role tasked with food production changed, changed hands three times. Um, obviously, this led to a severe lack of coordination when time was of the essence. Now, there was another organization which had overt links to the sector the National Farmers Union. Now, this was started in 1919 by the same Dr. John Borch we had mentioned earlier, the first superintendent or director of agriculture. And the co-founder was Carmelo Zamit Marmara, the man on the left. Now, the National Farmers Union wasn't a specific trade union in the militant sense of the word. It was more akin to an organization or a society. In fact, anyone could join up, men, women, children, politicians and merchants as well, landowners. 
The, their objective was to improve the farmer's lot, break the importer's cartel, and disseminate agricultural knowledge. But by the mid-30s, the National Farmers Union became a lobby, a landowning lobby, well within the grasp of the Strickland family. In fact, in 1925, um, Lord Gerald Strickland assumed the presidency. By then, numbers had dwindled. In 1921, he had close to 1,000 people, close to 1,000 members of this union. By 1938, there were 250, which obviously mirrors the dwindling importance of agriculture in daily life. Most people just literally down tools and try to find a job in the dockyard or in the victualling yard nearby. Strickland, as you can see, is the person on the right. Um, that picture was taken in 1939. So, had things carried on as they were, we can't say what if in history, but had things carried on as they were, the Farmers Union could have been on its way out. But speaking on being on the way out, um, in August 1940, Strickland died. His newspaper empire was inherited by one of his daughters, Mabel, whereas the National Farmers Union was given over to one of his nephews, Roger Strickland, the man on the left, as you can see. Roger Strickland was one of the most wealthy merchants and landowners throughout the colony, whereas Carmel Zammit Marmara, uh, he had aged in a few years, as you can see with all that work, um, was made agricultural liaison officer, and he was secretary general of the Farmers Union as well. And the National Farmers Union assumed a two-pronged attack, so to speak. Roger Strickland, Roger Strickland um, um, talked about the farming sector, fought for the farming sector and farmers in the Council of Government as he had become the leader of the Constitutional Party by 1941, by 1940, excuse me, whereas Carmel Zamit Marmara worked from the ground up. He had a lot of contacts with farmers, he used to give a lot of lectures. In the 20s, he had actually set up, edited and published his own agricultural journal, El Bidwi, which was reconstituted during the war as well, starting in 1942. And he had to fight the, for the farmer's corner as well. But he also had to work for government. So on the one hand, he had to make sure that farmers were getting their fair share, but he had to make sure that the government wasn't getting cheated by the farmers as well. So it was a bit contradictory. But during the war, the, Agri the uh, National Farmers Union acted as an, an unofficial arm of the, of the agriculture department, a pacifying arm, like the church as well. And by the late summer, early September 1940, the National Farmers Union had set up village committees in every village in Malta and in Gozo. The government hadn't, so the Farmers Union was actually well prepared for hostilities before the first bomb started. Now, by, um, in, on the 8th of September 1940, the National Farmers Union, the Malta branch, had actually sent a telegram to Lord Lloyd, the new colonial secretary. Basically, these farmers determined that they were, quote, to live or die with the British Empire. Not hoping to be outdone, the Gosden farmers sent their own letter. They said, us too, don't forget us. Now, by moving close to the structures of power, the NFU was positioning itself as a potential power broker in agrarian and national politics. One way which farmers were, let's say, brought in from their insularity, brought in from the cold, was through broadcast talks. Now, propaganda, and that is the word officials used in official documentation, not dissemination of information, not lecturing, propaganda. They knew what they were doing. Now, propaganda served to draw out positive attitudes, it served to nullify negative ones, and it served to attract the indifferent. Illiteracy in the countryside was beneficial, so there was a, mon a monopoly on communication. Most of these people didn't read. By 1920, only 11% of the population was literate. By 1940, about 15%, so not that much. So, gossip spread like wildfire, 
but these people could be molded into perfect agents. In fact, Carmel Zammit Marmara had written to the governor himself, only lectures and propaganda by a tactful individual who understands the ultra-conservative mentality of our farmers can turn out a successful scheme. In this direction, the National Farmers Union can be of very great service to the government. If it is taken into its confidence and not ignored as has been done in the past, it was mentioned in the Stricklandian period, the National Farmers Union wasn't even on the Food Control Board and the Agriculture Board by the late 30s. It was shut out from negotiations completely. Now, these broadcast talks started on the 31st of March, 1940. Farmers used to gather in village squares at 10.30 a.m. on Sundays, where redifusion sets were actually, actually set up. Um, some hamlets in the northern part of the, of the colony, including Gozo, still lacked redifusion by early 1942, because government did not want to spend money, they did not want to invest in communication. All these farmers were addressed by officials in the vernacular. These were written by Carmen Zamit Marmar himself. He was indefatigable in, this, um, um, in his job as agricultural liaison officer. But as the war dragged on, as the bombs got, um, uh, got tougher, and as the siege tightened, the chief government medical officer addressed these farmers as well, um, the lieutenant governor, the president of the union, and the governor himself. This is a propaganda script which was broadcast to farmers on Sunday, 7th April 1940. Now, as I said, these were written in the vernacular, but an English translation was sent to the governor's office. Now, these had started much the same way. These broadcast talks started with a short biography of the saint of the day, um, um, data related to crops which had to be planted, pruning measures, so on and so forth. But the most important thing was a fictional dialogue by two fictional farmers, Peppi and Tony. Um, the, all of these started the same way. You had one farmer who was riddled with anger, who was fed up with, with the state of affairs, and the other farmer, the noble savage who tried to make the other see the error of his ways. As you can see, Peppy, do you know what I'm inclined to do? I'm in half of a mind to leave everything as it is. To which Tony later replies, you mustn't talk like that, Pep. He's trying to make the other guy see the error of his ways. But after some toing and froing, the broadcast, the fictional broadcast, or the fictional dialogue, finished this way. It appears from this tone that if the Maltese farmer doesn't do his bit, he would be classed a laggard. Then it behoves us to lose no time in showing our mettle. Because the Maltese farmers have their traditions to uphold and must be true to them. That's the stuff, Pip. So, job done. Now you're talking like a man. Let us put our shoulder to the wheel and do our damnedest to win this war. Um, now, they are being positive because this was only in summer 1940. It did get worse as time wore on. And we must always keep in mind that if we lose this war, it would be at the expense of religion and of the small nations, Malta being case in point. I have nothing more to tell you now, Pep. See you next Sunday. Good day to you. Good day, Ton. And off they drive into the sunset to meet the following Sunday. Now, in January 1940, German bombers were introduced in theatre and the farming position was decidedly discouraging. Grand Harbor, specifically Senglia, was had to endure a savage assault which had never been experienced before the previous six months. So shipping now became more difficult and this actually posed more of a problem. Fodder had to be rationed, most of which was imported which means that shipping space had to be divided between military material, medicine, fuel, and agricultural produce as well. But in that same month, 2,600 tons of seed potatoes, luckily, were unloaded in Grand Harbor. To save on wheat, the surplus, of this, the surplus from this um, um, potato shipment was incorporated in bread. It was officially called wheat <clears throat> excuse me. 
Um, it was hated by bakers and it was reviled by the people over here. In fact, a few people who I managed to talk to because I work at the archives a few years ago still recall the horrid stench and the unpalatable taste of this bread in Maltese. They, they still called it uh, El Hops Liswet, so black bread. But on the positive side, 1,000 tons of wheat were saved. In March and in April, conscription and rationing was introduced, and this led to a labor problem as well. Most farmers' children were uh, drafted, and in fact, the National Farmers Union spent an entire year fighting on behalf of farmers to get their sons released. In May 1941, Crete had fallen, which changed the equilibrium in the Mediterranean. In June 1941, the, the Director of Agriculture was changed once again. Um, Robert Biazzini was a former clerk and statistician who was catapulted into the top job. Livestock was kept alive for milk production and as an emergency food reserve. And Air, Air Vice Marshal Hugh Lloyd, who was one of the RAF commanders, as I said earlier on, in June 1941 was taken round a, for a ride in Malta, in Rabat and the Mbina area. He motioned to his driver, telling him that he was actually very happy to see that the horses were well looked after, being washed every day as they were our reserve meat ration. Forage and maize was grown at the Marsa sports ground. As you can see, there's a picture over there. Unfortunately, most of this was destroyed during the infamous Black Winter of 1941 to 1942. Crops were destroyed all over the Mediterranean and the British realized that this could have posed a problem because they were actually blockading Greece and the entire um, Peloponnese Peninsula and the British were indirectly um, starving the Greeks. As a result, 300,000 Greeks died of starvation and malnutrition over a three-year period. So the British were alive to what food politics and agrarian politics and military maneuvers, they go hand in hand, could actually achieve. In May 1942, the governor, Sir William Dobby, was relieved of his duties through a lot of lobbying by Mabel Strickland, who was now heading the, um, um, heading the newspapers of the area, Il Berra and the Times of Malta, and he was replaced by the man on the right, General Sir Lord Gort, former governor of Gibraltar. Now, Gort had won a VC in World War I. He was called Tiger Gort, but at this point in time, in mid-1942, his star had faded somewhat. He had fallen from grace. From Tiger Gort, he was called Fat Man Gort, unfortunately for him. Um, one of the last things that Dobby had done before he had sailed to greener pastures in England was he, he decreased the food ration once again. There was infighting among the military chiefs. One, one of the first things God did was he cut them loose. He replaced all of them. So he had his hands full as well. Now, in this scenario, the sacrifices that siege conditions necessitated in everyday life had to be invariably extended to industries trying to keep the colony afloat and the people alive, and that meant agriculture. Um, the state had to intervene. Farmers were told what to plant and how to plant. They couldn't plant any legumes, they couldn't plant any fodder, it had to be imported. As a result, most animals had to be slaughtered, killed off. And this was the idea of the person on the right, Prof. Jack Drummond, who was the chief scientific advisor to the Ministry of Food. Also, the person on the left, Henry Hurst, was made Director of Agriculture in June 1942. So another change in the top job as well. There was a merry-go-round of promotions, as you can see. But both of these men agreed that 
rations had to be reduced. Men were on 1,000 calories a day. Even men working um, unloading ships on the waterfront were supposed to have 2,500 a day. But both of these men agreed that goats and any four-legged animals had to be slaughtered. So if you were a chicken, well done, you survived. But this wasn't taken all too lightly by the peasants, which we will see later on. But Jack Drummond, in his report, the Drummond Wall Report, because he came over with, a, with another Minister of Food official, Mr. E. Wall, talking about the black market, he attested the fact that it could not be eradicated. To eradicate the black market, it had to basically eradicate communication. And the black market consisted of just buying something which the government, government could not tax, and which the government had no control over. So it was close to impossible. Talked about the Victory Kitchens, which had been introduced a few months earlier, which further aggravated the problem, because the government bought food directly for the Victory Kitchens, so it didn't leave any food for people to buy on the side, on their own. And that's what actually accelerated the black market and looting and pilfering. So, the government in June 1942 had introduced the Serial Collection Scheme. This was a nationwide harvest of cereals, so grain and, um, um, grain and wheat. Government and Drummond and Henry Hurst realized that the politics of the poor are confined to bread. There's a quote in Maltese, I have to say it. Um, so apologies for the English speakers over here. Lizar kem t'mislum al boot. Money, food, if any of those factors are altered, you've got to show protest or maybe a rebellion on, on your hands. And that is one thing which the British did not want and could not afford, a rebellion in a country which was on its knees. So the serial collection scheme was introduced in June 1942. All the wheat had to be bought by government. No ifs, no buts. By mid-July 1942, 1,774 tons of wheat and grain were collected. This was over a six to seven week period. It wasn't enough. You had 270,000 people plus thousands of airmen, Royal Navy personnel, British Army personnel, so more than 300,000. Close to a third of a million people had to be fed and watered and protected. So the government actually looked to the periphery of the periphery, and that was Gozo. Gozo still held on to its, let's say, agrarian character. There was no industry on Gozo, but the peasants over there were actually much more interested than the ones in Malta were. Not only were they peasants, but they were cut off from the mainland, separated by a stretch of water. So, in early July 1942, the National Farmers Union unleashed a strenuous propaganda campaign throughout Gozo. As you can see, Roger Strickland took to the stage. There were meetings on a near daily basis throughout all the villages. Um, the head of the Gozo branch of the Farmers Union, Mr. Tony Scott, the one on the left, obviously planned these meetings. Thousands of farmers were addressed, and basically what the National Farmers Union was saying was, give us your wheat. Don't worry, you'll have enough on the site. Actually, bake your own bread, because farmers baked their own bread. But we need you to help us, because this place will eventually fall if you don't actually play the game. George Pisani can be seen behind his desk. He was the assistant information officer in Gozo. At that period, there's a statue of him at the Gozo bus terminus in Rabat. Um, and from, from his role in the seal collection scheme, in a case of art imitating life, George Pisani actually published a radio play called Il Jabrat al-Amah, The Wheat Harvest. And then you had Kalinu 
Vella Harbour, Harbour, excuse me, and Mr. George Ransley, the Commissioner for Gozo. So these men, these cohort, spent two months running around Gozo, basically telling farmers to give over their, um, their cereals. They were paid handsomely for this, and in about two months, 1,200 tons of wheat and grain were shipped over to Malta. 1,200. That's a, that's a significant number. As a result, the target date was pushed back by a month, which gave the government ample breathing time for the remnants of Operation Pedestal to come in, which brought in badly needed fuel. It brought in grain and wheat as well. Unfortunately, most of it was lost because it was caked in dust. It sunk to the bottom of the Grand Harbour. You had a lot of longshoremen and people and men working in the waterfront who actually jumped in and scooped it out of the oil and fuel infested water. Unfortunately though, in the case of bad management, the unsoiled wheat and grain was left by the harbour side for two days and nutrients just were spoiled. So most of the shipment was actually lost through uh, maladministration. But one such person who inevitably crops up during this period of the war, the siege, is the former Bishop of Gozo, um, Michael Gonzi. Now, Michael Gonzi, the story goes that Gonzi was called to a meeting by the governor in early July, so that was Lord Gort, and as he walked into the room, he was welcomed by two, two officers from the Ministry of Food. We don't know who these two officials were, but my hunch is that these could have been Prof Drummond and Mr. Wall. Till today, these officials have not been unmasked or named in any um, militancia or any um, um, official file. But basically, God said, even though you're Maltese, you're the Bishop of Gozo, people surely look up to you. Can you help us out, please? Okay, I just need uh, maybe two jerry cans of fuel and I'll be on my way. Now, in two interviews, which Bishop Gonzi had given to two historians, one of whom was a, um, a professor of history at the local university, he said that, he was driven around every village, every hamlet, and castigated farmers for holding on their wheat and grain, so hoarding. Now, hoarding and the black market were already classed as grave sins by the then Archbishop, Maura Caruana. But in these two interviews in the 70s, Bishop Gonzi had said that, yes, I did try my damnedest, I worked hard. In fact, I shipped over two truckloads of wheat to Malta. And no one seems to be asking the question, and this is the elephant in the room, were two truckloads of wheat enough? By late August 1942, late August, early September 1942, 8,000 tons of wheat were actually harvested from Gozo and sent over to Grand Harbour. The government said this still wasn't enough. So I, I, if I hazard a guess, I would say that no, two trucks weren't enough, but apparently a myth was forged. Gonzi slid ever closer to the structures of power. He was later on promoted to the topmost job in the land, Archbishop, and he was made Sir Michael Gonzi in 1944 due to his, um, his role in the Allied war effort. Most people say that Archbishop Sir Michael Gonzi saved the colony. He was always pro-British, um, regardless of what people say. He, in the 20s, he actually substituted English for Italian as the official language in the Curia and the seminary in Gozo. But he is one of the overbearing figures in this saga. In my opinion, and I can say this on tape, um, this myth was further burnished by him and by the colonial government. In 1943, when King George VI, in the summer of 1943, when King George VI 
felt it was safe enough to actually sail to Malta. Bishop Gonzi was personally introduced to the king by Lord Gort, much to Mabel Strickland and the Strickland's family um, anger, because he had a, a bone to pick with Gerald Strickland. But inevitably, um, Bishop Gonzi came out on top. He got a promotion and he got a knighthood at the end. During this period, the black market was all pervading. Now, this was in June 1942. This letter was sent from um, Halasha. There are scores of these letters at the National Archives, and these, these um, feelings are still prevalent in oral tradition to this day, even 80 years down the line. So this shows that um, hunger was rapacious. But a group of people actually sent this secret letter to the assistant to the lieutenant governor, which was forwarded to the lieutenant governor as well. These people um, identified and outlined people who, other people who were black marketeers and looters. So we've got names, we've got nicknames, we've got addresses as well. Number nine, St. Philip Square, Asha, and we've got ages as well. Um, witnesses were provided as well. Um, so these people did snitch. And, and a prominent witness was underlined. You can see it over at number 10, just at the bottom, Carmen Aspeteri. So these were people who put their reputations and their lives on the line. And I say lives on the line, even though these people did give their names and they signed off as the anti-black market band. They finished this letter by saying, if you reveal our names or this information comes in the hands of the police at Zaytun or Asha, the police were in on this as well, we are ready to swear an affidavit and publish it in the papers to show the people and the authorities that you have deceived the people and do not want anybody to give you information because you would have revealed those who have given you information and maybe one of us might find himself or herself stabbed or maimed by these robbers or by some member of their families at night, especially during an air raid. Now, this was written in the vernacular, in Maltese. The, this is just a translation. And the proper term used in the original letter was Yinsap Minshur. Now, this person here on the, at, the, at the upper left-hand corner is Vincent Caruana. He was born in 1922. Uh, up until last year, he was still alive. He was a refugee from Senglea moved over to Sijiwi twice, where he met my grandparents' family, that's how I know him. He was interviewed for the National Archives for the Memorial Project. He was conscripted as an artilleryman. And he, in this clip, which was recorded around seven years ago, in May 2017, um, he recounts how soldiers, any kind of military personnel, so airmen, artillerymen, especially those stationed in the fields, used to pilfer from the surrounding um, fields. Madonna has been, has been lax. I think that has been lax even. But I think it's been lax. 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 For example, when we were in the past, 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 and we were in the past, 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 we were in the past. now, what Vincent Caruana was saying over there is that things got so bad that, yes, it wasn't the first time that they used to trample in other people's fields. They used to steal potatoes, chickens, rabbits, and skin them and try to cook them in their own hut. Now, this was endemic, starting in the summer of 1942. I just stopped looking at the police occurrence books. 
over at the archives and from June till October 1942 in the Sijiwi, Zebuch, Rabat and Dingli area there was at least there were at least excuse me five instances of soldiers pilfering from fields on a daily basis things got so bad that soldiers both Maltese and British threatened to shoot and kill farmers unless they stopped them from you know, stealing from their fields, so anything was stolen, mostly potatoes and um, um, chickens and rabbits, let's not forget, goats were slaughtered, had been slaughtered by now, and most of the stuff that people had grown was actually wheat and grain. Now, oh, sorry, I have to go back, I'll, I'll save that, I'll save that to later. Now, as I said earlier on, Depending on the social certification of people, um, politics will take a... Um, just lost it, excuse me. Um, politics will be, let's say, meted out in a different form. Um, peasants either drag their feet, feigned ignorance, stole, and basically protested, either through the verbal arts, or through the written word. But, as I said, this was endemic. Senior officials in the government used their own government cars to ferry stolen goods, because they were safe from being checked, they were protected. Demolition and clearance personnel looted from damaged houses. People who knew of personnel in the demolition and clearance uh, corps used to wear their bands to steal firewood, to steal food, um, um, metal. Grocers used irregular weights on refugees as well. But we zero in on farmers as unfortunately the farmer, and this was said by, uh, by Roger Strickland himself in the Council of Government, the farmer is presented as a wicked old man out to make money. Um, most of these people, not just farmers, others, sought protection out of the misery of many. Unfortunately, hundreds of thousands of people had their backs up against the wall. But the thing that really irked farmers was their, their, their capital was killed off, goats. Now, goats were used for meat and for milk as well. And that's why the government had held off for such a long time for the slaughtering of goats. Milk had to be used by um, children and mothers and disabled people. The word used back then was invalids, unfortunately. The government and the National Farmers Union, which by now was on the agricultural board and was leading the agricultural department, had scheduled meetings with the farmers to try to get their side of the story. The farmer said, we can't obviously kill everything. Um, we, ha we need to get milk. And that's why powdered milk had to be shipped in through the June 1942 convoy, Operation Vigorous, which was unfortunately blown out of the water. Um, farmers were told that at first, 60% of nationwide herds were going to be killed. They were lied to because 90% were killed, which led to them sending this letter to the, well, to the governor himself. So that's Lord Gort. Um, I have to say it, it's an anti-Semitic letter. Um, the policy of slaughtering goats started by the government does not meet with the approval of the public, much less with the views of goat herds. Now, by the mid by the mid-1930s, around 4,000 goats were, used to be herded into Valletta every day. So 5,000. The movement to do away with our goats and the flourishing industry they kept has been launched by the present head of the agriculture department long before war conditions were hurled upon us. He knows very little. Now they're talking about Henry Hurst, who had been in the country since 1938 and who was the animal husbandry advisor. He knows very little, if any, about our local conditions. He is a Jew. And 
Jews are the so-called experts. He induced the government to bring from the UK, Tanganyika and elsewhere. Experience of conditions in those parts of the world do not necessarily combine with ours. We know it, everyone knows it, that Jews make use of all subterfuges to reach their aim. I'll stop there. Um, so peasants, to get their point across, used letters through their elites that meant seniors in the National Farmers Union. And when that didn't work, they resorted to doing their own thing. In fact, by the public abattoir, there was a thriving black market of all places. This was the message the government tried to get across. This cartoon was published in August 1942. Most people think that the war over here ended by August 1942, when Operation Pedestal sailed in. The war and war conditions lasted till 1943, but from 1943 until the post-war period, um, the black market was still in place. You had no food. Rationing was still in place as well. Post-December 1943, and that's when the siege was lifted, when another convoy came in and Malta was further used as an offensive base of operations, Following, in 1943, cooperatives started, more propaganda was put in place. In fact, films convoyed in from England started being shown in our cinemas, the cinemas which weren't, um, um, weren't by them destroyed. Cinema vans were brought in as well. This was such a, such a success that these films were actually became open to the public. Men, women and children as well, even from non-farming communities. The National Farmers Union, by 1945, died an ignoble death. Farmers realized that they were being used, and they set their sights on starting cooperatives. And this was finished by January 1946. Now, just to round this up, to bring this to the contemporary period, uh, the agrarian historian Theodore Shanin had declared it is commonplace to say that agrarian history is neglected, the fact is too obvious to be denied. If that were so, we would be mistaken into thinking that we are not going through a food crisis, therefore an agrarian crisis. We've had farmers' protests in India for the past four years, uh, over this past year or so, maybe even nine months. Farmers' protests have gripped North Africa and Europe, the war, in U the Russian war in Ukraine precipitated a regional and global crisis. Battle lines were drawn, land was seized, sanctions were put in place, scorched earth policies were implemented, which led to an ecological disaster in eastern and southern Ukraine, which was the breadbasket of Africa and the breadbasket of Europe. Maritime routes were placed under siege. Fuel prices shot up. We're still feeling this. Inflation. And this has become an existential crisis. Added to this, we have had violent farmers' protests as well in the European Union. The October 7th attacks in southern Israel turned that area of the Near East into a military, military zone, which outlawed agricultural activity in the name of security. Also, the ensuing siege of Gaza has in turn changed that enclave into a wasteland. 80% of agricultural area has been deemed destroyed. It is poisoned. As a result of the forgotten civil war in Sudan as well, which has just turned um, 12 months old, a full year, 11 million people could tip into starvation in the next six months. Added to this, the food security of Central and East Africa and that of countries surrounding the Persian Gulf, which depend on Sudan, could be heading to a problem. Now, it would be foolish of us to not learn the lessons of history, because history never repeats itself, but it does often rhyme. And that's it. Thank you very much.